don't got much left, but what I got, I'll share with you. <laughs> Recently, I had a conversation with someone, and uh, I said something like, you're doing the very best you can do, and just no matter what the outcome is, that's the best you can do, and you know you're doing the best you can do, so that has to be good enough. And then I said, oh, I just gave the Christian definition of perfect. Doing the best you can do is knowing that you're doing the best you can do, and doing the best you can do, the best you can do it, no matter what the outcome is, it's got to be good enough. And so um, I went home and I, I went online and I looked up scriptures that are now like wet and bleeding and smudged. But it's okay because I know the Bible by heart. So, But no, um, here's one that I like. In Matthew chapter 5, I think, Jesus said, Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. But he didn't even say perfect like I'm perfect in Jesus, but like your Father in heaven is perfect. And, okay, I just like to just keep reading some of these. And then uh, Leviticus, a similar word trend, as far as the original Hebrew or Greek text is translated to holy and it's be holy because I'm holy and we've heard this a lot and, and the concepts of perfection and holiness in the Bible have tripped up Christians forever and we counsel people with this scripture my grace is sufficient for you my power is made perfect in your weakness you know, when people come crying, they said, I, I'm failing and I, I did this and this didn't work out and I, 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 I can't hear God in my life or I can't get anywhere in my walk with the Lord. And we always say, well, you know, now God can really use you. Now God can really get to you because you're in your broken place. And, and uh, if that's not good enough, we'll say, in Ephesians, we are seated in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus, that's Ephesians chapter 2. That even now, God sees us as perfected and whole. And, and, and these are terms we throw around a lot in Christianity. And anyone that's been in the church for a long I just want to make sure I, I said all of them because I took the time to scribble. Um, but anyone who's spent a lot of time in the church has heard this, these terms thrown around you know, even in the hymn, in the hymns, you know, the, the concept of holiness. And, you know, I made a comment about Wayfair and Stranger earlier, and, you know, Amazing Grace is, you know, the most famous Christian song. And when you sing it, you call yourself a wretch. You know, you, you call yourself a, something subhuman in the eyes of God, or at least in your perception of yourself in the song. and and. And then Jesus exhorts us, God exhorts us throughout the Bible to be perfect and holy. And what on earth is that supposed to mean? And yeah, I kind of gave away my punchline already that it's just doing your, your, your bestest. But it's a little bit more than that. It's a little bit more than trying real hard and giving it a good college try. Perfection and holiness in the Lord matter. But it matters what they mean. First, it matters what they mean. And first and foremost, holiness is something that a human created in, in flesh, in carnality, in this world, in a fallen nature can't possibly ever be if it means being spotlessly clean and doing everything perfect and never thinking or an impure thought or never acting on an impure thought. It, it's physically impossible. So the, 
believer needs to find a way to partner with God, not only in doing everything right, but getting a right perspective of who they actually are in God. And this seems to be something that's just totally lost on um, the current state of Christianity that I see all the time, that, that we have forgotten that God so loved the world, not just us, and that, that God, God literally gave us Christ to reconcile himself with us, to make us a perfect and holy people. And instead, we have turned these concepts into an excuse for piousness and legalism so that we can make ourselves feel bad, we can make others feel bad, and we can try to control the society and culture around us. But in so doing, we miss out on the best part of all, and that is having a really happy, healthy dynamic in our relationship with God that allows us to enjoy what it means to be perfect and holy right now. But it comes from recognizing what, what God actually has accomplished in our lives and not looking in the mirror and judging what we've accomplished or looking at others and judging what they've accomplished. Because when, when God gave us Christ, and Christ went through this process of human life, and sacrifice, and death, and resurrection, God put something between Him and us that can never be taken away. And that is Christ Himself. But the Bible says that He stands in intercession for us at all times. And so, in childlike terms, when God looks at us, He sees Christ. He doesn't see our failed, broken self. And I never really liked that because that kind of sounds like well, we don't even matter anymore because God's blinded by the reflection of Christ on us. But it's a spiritual principle and it's much more complicated than that. And in reality, he sees us through the fulfillment and accomplishment of Christ. So he sees us as perfected by Christ. So it's, it's absolutely irrelevant what we say or do because he sees us as perfected. And he's right, right? Because he's God. And if, he, if that's his perception, then who am I to argue? Well, that's all we do. That's all we do. We, we want to prove ourselves to God. We want to make ourselves cleaner. And we want to make ourselves better. We want to make everyone around us cleaner and better. And at the end of the day, we're basically just spinning our wheels because Christ already accomplished making us perfect. And if you go back into the, the early Hebrew or Greek translations of, of holy that are used in the Bible, they really have more to do with being separate, more to do with being separate than being well behaved. I don't, I don't know why Christianity had to become a um, hall monitor religion, where you know there, there's just everywhere you turn in Christianity, there's somebody telling you, oh no, you're not supposed to do that. Oh no, you're not supposed to. Do that. Oh, no, you're not supposed to do that. Where's your hall pass? You know, and instead. Instead, we should have been the people of completion. We should have been the people of reconciliation and healing. We should be that in all things. The popular term for Jewish people who become Christians, like myself, um, are completed Jews. That's the popular term for, for us. And, and the reality is, is Christ has completed everyone. He's completed everyone by what he did. He's already done it. It's already happened. Everyone is complete in that. And, 
everyone should be treated like that. Everyone should be treated like they're complete. Everyone should be treated like they're perfect and whole in, in, in Christ. And instead, most people run around thinking they're incomplete and not whole. And most people are running around making sure they let everyone else around them know that they don't think the people around them are up to snuff either. But, but there's no peace. There's no hope. There's no joy. There's no life. And at the risk of sounding like Joel Steen, <laughs> we deny ourselves of the perfect life we're supposed to have in Christ every second that we do not come into agreement that it is finished, that the work was done, that it's just a process of us growing through it, but the push me, pull you, tug of war that all people have with God like they would their earthly parent, it's just robbing us of leading a perfect and whole life now. And perfect and whole does not mean problem and broken free. <laughs> You know, it doesn't mean that. It has to do with, like what is said, that we're walking in the heavenlies. We're, we're walking on water. We're rising above our circumstance because we know in the realm that matters, the eternal realm that matters, we're perfect. We're perfect and we're complete and we're whole and we're healed, and we are forevermore in Jesus' name. And if every single believer were walking around with that awareness, they would act totally different toward themselves, towards their family and friends and fellow Christians and the world and culture around them. It's physically impossible. It's physically impossible to be praising the Lord for that which you can't even see when you look in the mirror and then turn around and attack others. The mere practice, I use mirror and mirror in the same sentence and they sound alike. The mere, M-E-R-E -E, practice of looking in the mirror and saying that person that I see is perfect and whole and complete in the eyes of God and that has to be good enough for me, would actually train us to treat humanity different. But the truth is, the truth is, most of us don't like ourselves. Or we like ourselves way too much in the wrong ways possible. But the reality is, is wherever you are in the pendulum of the uh, bad romance you have with yourself, the reality is, is all of it has to be laid at the foot of the cross and say, my opinion of you doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you want to make my opinion of you matter, you're, that's fine. But it doesn't matter eternally. 90 years from now, you will not care what I think about you tonight. You will not care what I think about you tonight. It won't, it won't matter one bit. But you will care about what God always thought about you. You will care about that. And you will live in it and love in it and bask in it and praise Him for it and love your eternity with that. But the problem is, even though Jesus said, a man who is busy looking to the left and looking to the right 
is not worthy of the plow, even though Jesus said it, we are looking to the left, we're looking to the right, we're judging ourselves. You know, my opinion of you doesn't matter. It really doesn't. I care, that, I care what people think about me as much as anybody, but the truth is it really doesn't matter. Your opinion of yourself falls under the same category. Uh, it's great to have self-esteem. I'm super duper confident of a kind of guy, but compared to God putting a stamp on me and saying, by my decree as God Almighty, Paisley Yankolovich is perfect and complete forevermore. Uh, suddenly the fact that I'm I had to like do tonight with the zit on my nose. This isn't really that big of a deal. It's just one of those things. It's, you know what I'm saying? But we sit and stare in the mirror, whether it's the actual an actual mirror, and we count our blemishes, or we stare in the mirror of our circumstances, things that it didn't go right, or we stare in the mirror of the people around us, because you you know the people around you will make damn sure that they are a mirror for you. And it will always be an angle that makes you look fat. It's a given. They will always give you the worst possible perspective of yourself. That is a fact. And all we're doing is self-destructing. All we're doing is self-destructing. Believe it or not, the healthiest thing to do, aside from having no mirrors, but with hair like mine, you need a mirror. But the healthiest thing to do would be to walk by a mirror and look at yourself and say, perfect and whole and eternal and blessed and on the road to a great adventure in Christ. Gosh. And then do that with every human being you meet. Every single human being you come into contact, whether they go to church or not. Who cares? 90 years from now, I won't care if you went to church or not. I won't care if you accepted Christ or not. That is a fact. I'm going to be busy. And God forbid, I don't want to play in God's big old orchestra. Gosh, do I have to do music for eternity on top of this? Have I not done enough? Oh my God, I would have to sing Lord for all eternity. But Paisley, play Lord, play Lord. Jesus, enough! <laughs> If I ask people individually, what do you really think about yourself? What do you really think about yourself? Most of us would say things like, I'm a good person. I, I, I've never been a good person. I don't even know what that, that's, the concept of being a good person eludes me because very honest. I mean, I, please remember, I've walked with the Lord for 34 years, and I took Scripture very serious. And I equate being a good person with being lukewarm. I always have for some reason. I've always seen it as um, a cop-out. You know, some of us have better personalities than others. Some of us have a friendlier demeanor than others. You know, and that's just the way we're wired. But it doesn't make us good. It doesn't make us bad if you don't either. But I don't want to be a good person. I want to be a right person. And another term, along with perfect and holy, is righteous. And this is, this, this <laughs> all the men of God struggle with this one. All the ministers especially struggle with the concept of righteous because we're all really self-righteous. I mean, that's the truth, you know, in our own ways. I mean, you, you don't get to do this if you're not a fighter of some sort. You know, if you don't stand up and pound your chest, you don't really get to preach one day. You kind of have to fight your way into it a little bit. So we're all born with a certain degree of self-righteousness in our, wired in our flesh. But... Um, Righteousness, according to God, is right standing with God. That's it. 
It has, and who, who accomplished that? Me? No. Jesus accomplished that. Jesus made it happen. Jesus made our right standing with God. Jesus paid for our perfection in the eyes of God. Jesus paid for our wholeness in the eyes of God. Everything good about what we have in the eyes of God, Jesus accomplished. All we have to do is enjoy it. All we have to do is apply it to our day-to-day -day world to have a more peaceful and joyful and hopeful life experience. It seems really easy, but it starts with who do you see when you look in the mirror? And what do you really think about that person? And I'm not telling you to take stock. I'm telling you, asking, what do you already do? You know, how hard are you on that person to begin with? How hard are you? And a lot of us aren't hard on ourselves. We're hard on someone else, so we just deflect it somewhere else. But it carries over to, how are you to the person in the mirror? You know, how, how do you perceive them? And then how do you perceive your loved ones, your family, your the people you meet on the street, strangers. How do you perceive humanity? Do you see everyone that, as someone who needs to be fixed? Do you see everyone that um, falls into different categories based on their spiritual beliefs? Do you see people that universally are equal and perfect and lovable not easily lovable sometimes, I will give you that. But do you, do you see people as equal, like God does? Or do you, do, you, do you categorize people? Do you compartmentalize people? I mean, we all do it. We all do it. We all judge. We all assess. We all do this. But the question is, are you willing to consider that there's no way you can live your perfect and whole life on planet Earth and experience your right standing in God to the degree you should unless you're willing to lay down your freedom to differentiate the value of every human being based on your opinion of them, including and especially yourself. Because, oh my gosh, I've gone from Joel Holstein to RuPaul. Because if you don't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love somebody else? No. You know, but that's the truth. It's, it's not, it's paraphrasing. I would say this if you do not recognize that your accomplishments do not make you who you are in the eyes of God, but it is his accomplishments that make you are in his eyes. You can never experience peace, full, unfiltered, unadulterated peace, joy, love, hope. You can't. Because you're always going to have that gnawing thing at the back of your head, well, I should do this, or I should have done this, and if I had done this better, and I didn't do this, and I failed at this, and I did, and I did, and then we go back to... Did you try? Because, gosh, some people don't even try. Some people don't even try. I remember I went to California to preach, and and according to them, I did a horrible job. And and I walked out, and you know they came after me and, and stuff and said what they said and all this. And I looked at them, and I said, I did my best. I did my best. I couldn't have done any better than I did, or I would have. You know what I'm saying? Like, like... Can I have a bad night? Am I allowed to have a bad night? Because I'm just fine with having a bad night. I mean, I've had so many bang up nights in my ministry career. I can count on one hand how many times people have come back and say, <laughs> you know? And I always say to that, I go, well, maybe you just didn't like what I said more than it wasn't right on. But I know how hard I'm trying. I know. I don't want to brag about it. Tonight, when uh, a week or two from now, when I'm all better, I will brag about tonight. I, I've done the impossible here tonight. That's all I can say. But, but, it has nothing to do with it. It's, it's, 
in my life. It's 24-7. I am trying seriously to be the best Paisley possible. Not because of accomplishments, though I wish I had more, but because I want to be right with God. And to be right with God, I have to lay that down, basically. I have to say I'm already right with God. Now what, now what do we want to focus on? He made me right. I didn't. But until I get to a place where I can look at everybody exactly the same, which means I really have to lower the bar. I hate to break it to you. I just have to like a lot of people less. Because <laughs> that would make it easier. But tough group. Maybe I didn't say that. You're laughing. But you're laughing because I didn't get a joke. I laugh on it. Okay, okay. I'm going to wrap this up. So in conclusion, <laughs> in a little, a little country called Conclusion, they don't care about our election, by the way. In conclusion, they don't care about our elections. Just so you know, it's not the only thing on planet Earth. Uh, the Conclusionites have their own worries. But in this instance, in conclusion, a man or woman should take stock in themselves. They should soul search. They should be introspective. They should question their life choices. They should admit to their regrets. They should repent of their sins. But none of that changes your standing in God. He recreated you perfect in Christ. He recreated you perfect. You were doomed, he undoomed you. End of story. The sooner we can see ourselves as perfect and complete and whole and righteous in all the good, healthy, beautiful, non-sanctimonious sort of ways, we can start looking at others like that. And the sooner we can accomplish seeing others like that, we might actually have a little bit of peace in our lives. And I'm thinking maybe even some actual accomplishments that will make us actually feel really good about ourselves. See the cycle? We want so bad to prove ourselves and get this and get this and have this and do this, but most people don't accomplish what they set out to accomplish in this life. That's the truth. No matter how hard they try, most people don't get the brass ring. Unless they reach for the right brass ring. Unless they reach for the right one. The one where they're perfect and whole and complete and in great standing with God and they know how much He adores them and they never have to do anything to win that or to improve it and they adopt that for themselves and ultimately for others. That is true success. Amen? I'm going to pray for everybody and I'm going to let you guys escape.